Okay, guys, settle down. So the topic today is carpal instabilities. So first I'm going to lay out the anatomy of the wrist. I'm not going to spend too much too long on this uh, part of the talk, but basically the wrist uh, is interposed between the forearm and the hand. Um, it consists of the distal aspect of the radius and ulna, the two carpal rows, proximal and distal, as well as um, the proximal aspects of the metacarpal bones. So this is a, a mnemonic that I found helpful to remember the bones of the wrist. And another run that I find useful to remember what's uh, the trapezium and the trapezoid, what comes first, is the trapezium is under the thumb. So it's important to always examine, and I'll talk about this time and time again in this presentation, but always look for the carpal arcs, or also known as the galula arcs, uh, named after the person who described them. So there are three arcs. The proximal arc is outlines the proc proximal aspect of the first carpal row. The second arc outlines the distal aspect of the first carpal row. And note that the pediform is not included in these arcs. Um, and then the third arc outlines the proximal aspect of the capitate and handmaid. It's important to understand, to have a general understanding of the ligamentous uh, relationships around the wrist to understand carpal instability. And it's, I've kind of made it fairly basic. Uh, it can be broken down into both, they can be broken down into both intrinsic versus extrinsic ligaments. So intrinsic ligaments, by far the most important ones here are the scapulinate ligament and the lunotriquetral ligament. When you look at the extrinsic ligaments, so intrinsic ligaments are, uh, they, they arise from a carpal bone and they insert onto a carpal bone, whereas extrinsic ligaments arise from the radius, usually, and insert on the carpus. By far, the most, the most important group of extrinsic ligaments are the palmar ligaments, and there are three important ligaments to remember from uh, that category. They are the radioscapal capitate ligaments, ligament, uh, and that acts as a, a waist or, or a seat belt across the scaphoid. The luno, radio luno triquetral ligament, which has a more horizontal orientation, and the short radio lunate ligament, which is an important stabilizer of the lunate bone. The dorsal uh, ligaments, extrinsic ligaments of the wrist are less important, and the only really important ligament to remember here is the dorsal radiocarpal ligament, and that comprises all three of these ligaments that you see here, the, the uh, radiotriquetral, radiolunate, and the radioscaphoid. They're all known as the DRL ligaments. So as far as an approach goes, most people, aside from dedicated scaphoid views, most people aren't and will never be familiar with stress and dynamic views. So we have to obviously uh, be familiar with, uh, with PA, oblique, and lateral views, but for wrist instabilities, the PA and lateral views are most important. So for a P standard PA view, the shoulder is abducted 90 degrees, the elbow is flexed 90 degrees, and the hand is rested on the plate, not, not the wrist on the plate. So if it's done properly, the axis of the third metacarpal capitates, lunate, and radius should all be roughly collinear. The ulnar styloid should be the most lateral uh, aspect. And there are a few things that you should focus on in every PA wrist. So first, the joint spacing should be uniform in the carpus and roughly it should be one to two millimeters. If it's greater than four millimeters, then that's definitely abnormal. The carpal arcs, like I mentioned before, should always be examined. And if there's any disruption in the arcs, then that's a, an indicator of ligamentous disruption, dislocation, subluxation, or fracture. And similarly, overla any overlapping surfaces are, ab are abnormal in a properly performed PA. In a lateral view, um, the arm is adducted, elbows flexed, and the, the technologist should make sure that the axis of the third metacarpal is collinear with the radius. And so you should see that on the, on the uh, properly performed lateral radiograph. 
the third metacarpal capitate, lunate, and the radius should be nearly collinear. And then there's a something called a scapho piso capitate criterion, which is when you assess a lateral radiograph for whether or not it's, it's rotated, um, you should look at the dorsal, sorry, the volar aspect of the pisiform. It should always be between the volar aspect of the scaphoid and the volar aspect of the capitate. And I'll show examples of that. And these are just uh, illustrations of the standard technique. So here's a normal PA radiograph of the wrist. You can see that the third metacarpal, capitate, lunate, and radius are all collinear. The ulnar styloid is the most lateral aspect. The joint spacing is uniform and is roughly one to two millimeters. And the, carpal, the three carpal arcs are all intact. Now aside from these landmarks, you should look for uh, more subtle signs of injury. And one, one that's often talked about is called the, uh, sca you can't see the words, but scaphoid fat pad sign. So um, if, you, if you have uh, obliteration or displacement of this fat pad, that can be an indicator of injury. On the lateral view, um, this is the scapho piso capitate criterion. Uh, you can see that the ventral aspect of the pisiform is between the scaphoid and the ventral aspect of the capitate. So this is, a, is an acceptable uh, lateral radiograph of the wrist from a rotation perspective. But you can see that the axes of the uh, metacarpal and the radius are not collinear, so it's, it's slightly suboptimal from that perspective. Another uh, soft tissue landmark you should look for in the lateral radiograph is the pronate or fat pad. And this is often seen, uh, it, it, obliteration or uh, displacement of this can be seen in distal radius or ulnar injuries. So in the lateral radiograph, it's, there are two angles that are of uh, utmost importance, and they are the scapholunate and the capitolunate angles. So as everyone knows, the scapholunate angle should be between 30 and 60 degrees, and the capitolunate angle should be between 0 and 30 degrees. Um, there's an illustration there on the right, but I'll, I'll talk more about that in, in the next few slides. But basically, to draw these angles, you have to know how to properly draw the axes, and I'm going to talk about those now. So I, it's something I actually didn't, I wasn't quite aware of before I started this project. Uh, sorry, Dr. Mitchell and Boyd. <laughs> so here is a, a, a normal lateral radiograph. So the lunate axis, you, you first you draw a line through the distal poles of the lunate, and basically you uh, draw a line perpendicular to that. So that's the lunate axis. The scaphoid axis is a line drawn along the volar aspect of the scaphoid, both the distal and proximal poles. It should be connected. And the capitate, you just run a line straight through the body of the capitate. And to make the angles, they're just obviously a combination of the uh, of the of the axes, so scapholunate angle is between the scaphoid and lunate axis, and the, here's the capital lunate angle. So carpal injuries involve high energy wrist hyperextension. They're they're often young male patients. Uh, the typical injury patterns are hyperextension injuries from MVC sports or significant falls. Um, by their nature, they uh, involve severe disruption of soft tissues, and they're complex injuries and they're typically treated with open reduction internal fixation. Now thankfully, uh, carpal injuries uh, occur in predictable patterns. So there are two main patterns uh, of injury that are talked about in the literature, the lesser arc and greater arc patterns. So the lesser arc is almost a pure ligamentous injury about the lunate, and the greater arc injury pattern involves a perilunate dislocation as well as a fracture through any of the bones surrounding the lunate in that line as described. The vulnerable zone is defined as the zone between those two arcs, and that's where most injuries of the wrist occur. So for the, peri for the lesser arc injury pattern, it's also known as the uh, progressive perilunar instability theory, where in a clockwise fashion, the, there are ligamentous injuries uh, about the lunate uh, in a sequential fashion as well. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in the next few slides. Basically, you can see one is in the region of the scapholunate joint, Two, there's disruption of the lunocapitate alignment. Three, there's disruption of the triquetralunate ligament. And uh, four, there's complete ligamentous disruption of both the lunate and the lunate dislocates. Uh, 
So all these are unstable patterns as well. Um, this, for the first stage of uh, lesser arc injury, uh, it's, it's called scapulonate disruption. So everyone has seen this, uh, I'm, I'm sure, but um, if you look at the scapulonate interval, if it's widened, uh, which means if it's greater than two millimeters, then that's probably, it, it could be abnormal. Um, it normally it should be two millimeters or less, but if it's greater than four millimeters or greater than or equal to four millimeters, it's definitely abnormal. Um, there are very rare exceptions to that, uh, but um, so so that's also known as a Terry Thomas sign. It implies scapulonate interosseous disruption, interosseous ligament disruption, and with that scapulonate interosseous ligament uh, injury, you can also have extrinsic ligament injury. Um, particularly, what often happens with hyperextension is you have the uh, scapulonate ligament this injury, but you also have you may have a volar extrinsic ligament injury. And if that happens, then the scaphoid is, is allowed to tilt in a volar uh, direction, and that's called rotary subluxation of the scaphoid. And you classically see a ring sign on the PA radiograph. In this radiograph here, um, you see that uh, there's a widened scapulonate interval. This can always be cons confirmed with arthrography, which I'm not going to talk about arthrography too much. I think this is the only slide, actually, in this entire talk. Um, and this is the uh, British comedian and actor Terry Thomas that the sign is named after. So the second stage of lesser arc injury involves perilunate dislocation, and this involves disruption of the radiocapitate ligament. So on the lateral view, as you can see here, the carpus is quite evidently dislocated dorsally, and that's it's almost always dislocated in a dorsal direction rather than volar. Uh, you can see that the lunate is still aligned with the radius, and on the PA radiograph, uh, if you look for, if you imagine in your mind the second carpal arc, you can't, you can't draw it, it's, it's disrupted. So the PA radiograph will suggest the diagnosis. I also wanted to point out that these injuries, this is just a reminder, these injuries occur in a sequential fashion. One, they usually occur, usually when you have a stage two injury, you're also gonna have a stage one injury. And you can see that the scapulonate interval here is widened. Uh, so there's both a stage one and stage two injury. The third stage of perilunate instability or, uh, or lesser arc pattern of injury is triquetral dislocation or fracture. So you can have uh, disruption of, of any number of ligaments, uh, either the lunotriquetral ligament, you can have disruption of the extrinsic, either the volar or dorsal ligaments about the triquetrum, and then you can have avulsion of fragments of bone related to that. So the triquetrum is un may be unstable. You could have a malrotated triquetrum. You may see, it's, it's not common, but you may see triquetral lunate diastasis or fracture. In this case, you can see a triquetral fracture dorsal to the carpus. And finally, the fourth stage is when the lunate is basically left without any ligamentous attachments whatsoever. So this, uh, the, the lunate in this case is dislocated um, in a volar direction it results in the in the classic spilt teacup sign, uh, but you can also see that the capitate is aligned with the distal radius. So this is a typical case of perilunate dislocation. And on the PA radiograph, just to point out, the uh, when the lunate is 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 inclined in a volar direction, it'll often have a triangular or um, as opposed to a trapezoidal uh, anatomy, it'll have a triangular anatomy. And you can see that the second carpal arc is, is disrupted here as well. And also, uh, as a, going back to the three things that you should be looking for on the PA radiograph, there's overlap of bones so you, between the lunate and the scaphoid and the lunate and the capitate. So you know that there's going to be, before you move on to the lateral exam, there's going to be a significant injury here. So the greater arc pattern of injuries um, involve a perilunate dislocation with an associated <coughs> fracture about the lunate. And then but, uh, the, nomen the nomenclature goes as follows. The fracture is uh, talked about first, uh, and then you use a prefix trans when you talk about which fracture is involved. And the dislocation, which is a perilunate dislocation, is mentioned second. So if you have an, a, an entire greater arc injury, then this would be called a transcaphoid, transcapitate, transhamate, transtriquetral perilunate dislocation. 
Uh, most commonly, though, you see a, the, by far the most common uh, greater arc injury is a transscaphoid perilunate dislocation. And this is an example of that entity. You can see that the scaphoid is, is fractured and, and displaced, and which by its nature, without the perilunate dislocation, is an unstable uh, pattern because scaph whenever the scaphoid is displaced more than one millimeter, then that's uh, uh, technically unstable. And you can see on the lateral radiograph that the um, carpus is dislocated in a volar direction here. So it's transcaphoid perilunate dislocation. Here's an example here of a transcaphoid trans ulnar styloid trans triquetral perilunate dislocation. And there's a triquetral fracture. So when you talk about ligamentous instabilities, it's it's, a, it's kind of a confusing topic. Um, so I just finished talking about the patterns of injury. Now all of those injuries are, are considered to be unstable carpal injuries. But now I'm going to talk about instability. And the reason why I'm talking about it in a different part of the presentation is because almost every reference separates the two. So the first way to think about it is the mechanism of injury, even though they're all unstable injuries. So, so the le lesser and greater arc injuries uh, refer to the sort of refer to common patterns of, of injury. And ligamentous instabilities are talked about in a separate uh, fashion. So these are injuries of the carpus that are considered to be present whenever symptomatic malalignment exists or when the kinematics are disrupted. So we don't look for the kinematics, obviously, in static radiographs. And very few of us, are, I think, are familiar with stress and dynamic views. So we're not going to diagnose uh, dynamic instabilities on static radiographs. We will diagnose, we can diagnose static instabilities, however, and by their nature, they involve more complete ligamentous disruption and they, because they have static malalignment. The classification schemes are controversial, um, and I'm going to avoid these classification schemes and just focus on individual patterns here. So as far as the etiology goes, um, Acute or chronic trauma are common causes of ligamentous instability, and it's important to know that a patient may have a static malalignment after an acute injury, or they could present months or years down the road with a static malalignment, and they may not ever remember the initial inciting event. Um, synovitis, especially rheumatoid arthritis, CPPD are common causes, and avascular necrosis, like Kienbach's uh, malaise, are, are common causes of ligamentous instability or they lead to ligamentous instability. So you, re you remember the first uh, pattern of ligamentous instability. It's, if it's the first lesser arc pattern. I'm, I'm going I'm to kind of talk a bit more about this, though. It's the most common um, instability pattern that we see. It may be associated with scaphoid or distal radius fractures. And in a simple... Um, clear-cut case, you're just going to see uh, widening of the scaphalunate interval. So greater than 2 millimeters, definitely greater than 4 millimeters is abnormal, but can be suggested if it's greater than 2 millimeters. Now, if you have disruption, I've talked about this before, but if you have disruption of the volar extrinsic ligaments, the scaphoid can, be, can rotate in a palmar direction, and that's called rotary subluxation of the scaphoid. And with progressive uh, ligamentous damage to the extrinsic uh, ligaments of the wrist, the lunate actually will dorsiflex. And the reason why it dorsiflexes is because the scaphoid natu naturally tends towards palmar flexion. If you get rid of the ligaments, it'll just palmar flex. If you get rid of the ligament between the scaphoid and the lunate, the lunate won't have that counterbalancing or, sorry, volar flexing force, and it'll, it'll just allow, it'll be allowed to rotate in a vol in a uh, dorsal direction. So the, the classic pattern for this uh, on lateral radiograph is a DC pattern or dorsal intercalated segmental instability. Attention to the lunate bone is crucial in this case and in, in almost every case of carpal instability. So here DC, so the normal uh, scapal lunate angle is 30 to 60. If it's greater than 60 it's suggestive of a DC pattern. 
usually th these have greater than 70 degree uh, angles. And the capital lunate angle is normally 0 to 30, and in DC it's often greater than 30. Here's an example of a DC pattern. Um, you can see that the patient has had a fracture of the distal radius. There's widening of the scapha lunate interval. Um, there's rounding of the distal aspect of the lunate, which uh, can often be seen with uh, dorsal tilting of the lunate. On the lateral radiograph, this is where it becomes quite obvious that there's a malalignment exists. You can see the lunate is dorsiflexed. The scaphoid, the scapholunate um, angle is significantly greater than 60 degrees. And the lunocaphate angle is significantly greater than 30 degrees. So this is a DC pattern. Now the final, um, for scapholunate dissociation, there are, like I said, the classification schemes are complex, but it's, they're, they're graded from one to four. And the final stage of the scapholunate dissociation is said to be a slack wrist or scapholunate advanced collapse. And this is a specific pattern of osteoarthritic changes that occur about the wrist with scapholunate dissociation. It starts at the radioscapoid joint and it eventually affects the scapocapitate and lunocapitate articulations. Finally, the, the capitate will move, dorsal, or, uh, sorry, move in a proximal direction and into the gap between the scapholunate interval. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to mention that non-united scaphoid fractures um, can also have a very similar pattern of osteoarthritic change, and that's called snap wrist or scaphoid non-union advanced collapse. This is an example of slack wrist. You can see that the scapholunate, sorry, the scapholunate interval is widened. There is osteoarthritic changes between the radioscaphoid joint and the capitate has moved proximally. The carpal height here, which I'll talk about in a minute, is diminished, but it's, it's fairly apparent that the carpus is diminished, it is uh, um, short. This is a case of snack wrist. Uh, you can see that the, there's, there's a non-union uh, non of a scaphoid fracture. There's osteoarthritic changes between the lunate and capitate, and the capitate has moved down. And uh, just as an aside, the popular, a popular treatment for treat, to treat symptomatic patients with slack wrist, they're not always symptomatic, but when they are, is excision of the scaphoid and what's called a four-bone fusion, the fusion, fusion between the lunate capitate, triquetrum, and uh, hamate. So how can we tell that the carpus is reduced in height? Um, well, these, these measurements have been defined in the past. First, you measure the carpal height uh, directly. So you measure between the distal radius and the distal capitate. Divide that by the length of the third metacarpal. And you don't have to remember the number, but I think it's important to know that it can be done, um, but usually it's around 0.54. Problem arises whenever the third metacarpal is cut off, which is not uncommon. So there's a, an alternate way to measure this. So you measure the carpal height directly, and then you measure the capitate height along the axis of the capitate, and uh, the uh, division should be around 1.57. And you can see just by inspection that this carpus is diminished in height compared to the normal car carpi on either side. So the second most common cause of ligamentous cause of instability is lunotriquetral dissociation. And this is not, I don't think it's, well, it, authors uh, other than me say that this is not well recognized by, by many people. And so as far as the incidence goes, even though it's the second most common cause, it can vary in the literature anywhere from rare to not unusual. Um, they, they often occur with triangular fiber cartilage tears. And like I talked about before, we, with plain radiographs, we can't diagnose a partial tear of the lunotriquetral ligament. Um, but when there's a complete tear, then this is where we see the VC pattern of instability. And what happens here is the triquetrum normally holds the lunate. It, it normally applies a dorsiflexion force to the lunate. And I talked about before, the scaphoid normally applies a volar flexion force to the, lun to the lunate. Um, 
So when you have disruption of the lunotriquetral ligament, you lose that dorsiflexion force. The lunate moves uh, in the same direction as the scaphoid, and you have diminished angle between the scaphoid and the lunate. And that's what's known as VT, or volar intercalated segmental instability. So normally the scaphoid lunate angle is 30 to 60. If it's less than 30, that's indicative of this pattern of injury. And on the PA radiograph, um, uh, characteristic, characteristically you see either a moon-shaped lunate or a triangular lunate. You always look for the carpal arcs, and uh, sometimes, but very rarely, you'll see an increased lunotriquetral gap. Here is the uh, uh, just a schematic showing the VC pattern of injury. You can see the scapal lunate interval, or sort of the angle, is less than 30. And this is uh, the only local example that uh, we could dig up for a VC pattern. And it's, it's not an obvious one, it's fairly subtle, but you can see that the lunate is tending towards palmar tilt here. Here's a, here's a more blatant example. First, um, look at the lunate. You see that there's an abnormal triangular configuration. Second, if you try to draw the second carpal arc, you can't. Um, so there's obviously a carpal injury here. And um, on the lateral view, you can obviously see the scapha lunate uh, angle is significantly less than 30. So another pattern, common pattern of ligamentous instability is radiocarpal instability. And the way to think about these is normally all those extrinsic ligaments that I talked about. Um, so, you, so you have, uh, with your distal radius, you have an ulnar tilt. You usually have an, uh, an ulnar uh, tilt on the PA radiograph. And then on the lateral radiograph, there's a volar tilt to the distal articulating surface. And to, to keep the carpus from sliding down those two tilts the, uh, are the extrinsic ligaments. Any failure of these uh, likely usually result in ulnar or volar translocation. And madelung and rheumatoid arthritis are common causes of radiocarpal instabilities. And traumatic, in this case, is less common. Ulnar translocation is by far the most common cause, or so the most common um, direction of movement for radiocarpal instability. And it's useful to break it down into two types. And the reason why it's useful is, well, they're obvious on radiographs, but it's useful because different uh, surgical approaches are used for each type. So with type one, the entire carpus is displaced with the scaphoid in an ulnar direction. And with type two, the scaphoid remains uh, put but you'll see the scaphal lunate interval is widened and the lunotriquetal tri complex moves in an ulnar direction. And so when you see a Terry Thomas sign or, or increased scaphal lunate interval, always look for any translocation of the lunotriquetal complex because the surgeons need to fix that as well as the scaphal lunate ligament. Now, there are lines um, that that are also indicate whether or not the objective signs of um, ulnar translocation. And traditionally, this is how you do it. You draw a line down the, uh, down the barrel of the ulna. You put a dot in the middle of the captate head. And then you connect uh, in a perpendicularly. You, you measure between the dot and the line. And you divide that by the third metacarpal length. And that should be around 0.3. If it's less than 0.3, then that's indicative of ulnar translocation. Practically, I don't think many people actually do this, but practically you should look for two things. Um, for type 1 injury, you're going to have widening between the radial styloid and the scaphoid. And with type 2 injury, sorry, uh, with both types of injuries, you should see more than one half of the lunate ulnar to the radius. You can see in this case, um, most, you know, more than one half of the lunate is covered by the radius. So I couldn't, um, it, th these are two examples from, from the literature. Uh, here's a type one example. You can see that there's increased gap between the scaphoid and the radial styloid. And the lunate, more than one half of it is, oh, is slit, slid off the, uh, the uh, radius. That's type one injury. Type 2 injury, uh, apparently the authors maintain that the uh, distance between the radial styloid and the scaphoid here are within normal limits. Uh, 
um, but you can see that the scape lunate interval has widened and the lunate has slid off of the radius, so that's indicative of a type 2 inch, type 2 ulnar translocation. Now there are other rarer types of radiocarpal instability, and I'll just quickly describe them. Um, if the carpus, the carpus can translocate in a radial direction, and usually this occurs at, with two types of fractures. Um, in this case, this is a chauffeur type fracture through the radial styloid, and, but you can also see this pattern in, in dorsal Barton fractures. With volar translocation, these are, this is often due to rheumatoid arthritis, uh, CPPD, and trauma. And with dorsal translocation, this can often be seen with distal radial fractures that have healed with the distal radial articular surface in a uh, dorsal inclination. And this is an example that, that I showed before of a case of slack wrist. You can see that the lunate has too much coverage by the radius, so th this is a case of radial translocation as well. I'm actually going to skip by this whole topic of mid-carpal instability. Um, it's, it's very complex. There's not a lot of literature on the topic, and most of the time you have to have uh, dynamic or stress views to diagnose this. But I will mention in, in bold right here, uh, when it's severe, you'll often see a VC or DC pattern of injury, which everyone can recognize. So, in conclusion, uh, carpal instability is a sophisticated diagnostic uh, topic. The key um, for most people is um, using a, is a PA and lateral radiograph. So always look for radiographic positioning because all the angles and the lines and the measurements I talked about uh, are moot if the, if the positioning is off. Always look for subtle soft tissue signs like the scaphoid fat pad sign that I talked about. The lunate is crucial as far as diagnosing these instabilities. Um, and in particular, the scapha lunate and the capital lunate angles. And the galula or the carpal arcs are also, also of utmost importance on the PA radiograph. Because sometimes the lateral, you may have a good PA, but you don't, may not have a, a good lateral radiograph. And so if, if you can't make heads or tails what's going on in the lateral radiograph, then it's important to to recognize an abnormality on the PA radiograph, even though it's less specific. So, in general, in, in my talk, I kind of, um, I broke down the instability patterns into three major categories. And so, the first I talked about was lesser arc pattern of injury, and this is also known as the catchphrase, progressive perilunate instability. And the two most common patterns of ligamentous instability within this, within this group that I talked about and focused on were scapholunate dissociation and triquetralunate dissociation. Remember, with scapholunate dissociation, you see a DC pattern, and it can progress to slack wrist with, os with characteristic osteoarthritic changes. With triquetralunate dissociation, the classic pattern for this is a VC pattern. Um, then I talked about greater arc patterns of injury, and by far the most common um, manifestation of this pattern of injury is transcaphoid perilunate dislocations. And then I talked about radiocarpal instabilities, and by far the most common uh, instability in this pattern is ulnar dislocation. So I want to thank Gord Boyd and Mike Mitchell for supplying the majority of the cases in this talk. And uh, if you have any questions, let me know. Yeah. I have a question. Um, if you do a sequential fracture, does that always implicate uh, lunar mass injury? <laughs> oh. uh, <laughs> it's funny because I, a couple days ago, I, I remember thinking about that, and then I didn't investigate my, that thought any further. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to say I don't, I don't think so, but uh, I'd love Gord Boyd to. No, I don't think so. I mean, they're pretty common. The second one's common carpal fracture. Yeah. Right? It's, uh, it's like in most countries. So it's an evolution. Yeah, sorry, I, I just thought about that question. And uh, yeah, you, w with instability, you should see, like, like, that's the third stage of the perilunate instability. Mm -hmm. So you should see stage one and stage two along with that. Right. So you should have a perilunate dislocation as well as widening 
I mean, classically widening at this k limit interval. So even in the acute situation, you should also see that degree of displacement if there is no associated with it. Like, if you've got a fractal fracture, it will have been spared off. It's not something that develops later, all those spaces? That's not, 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 not,